Good morning. Good morning. There's Scott coming down the aisle. <laughs> all right, so good to see all you guys this morning. You know, um, we have a, a very important lesson this morning, and there are a lot of questions when you, when you start studying this kind of thing. There's a lot of questions. <laughs> this is why I, I think it's good to read the Psalms. Uh, the problem with reading the Psalms is that they're kind of repetitious. And um, I like it when the heading is here, given, given to me, like this is a Psalm of David. I feel like I kind of know David because <laughs> I've studied about him, you know. <laughs> Some of these other people, this Asaph, I don't know him at all. But he must have been a good musician because he's on a lot of these so anyway, as we get started here this morning, we are, we are studying about singing the Lord's song in a strange land. And I want you to know I've been doing that for a long time. <laughs> but I've had, a, I've had a helper to help me along the road. <laughs> That's good. Yeah, there you go. I wish I could sing it. You know? I've often wished as I've read some of these that we would have somebody come from that era and actually sing the song and play it like David did. David was the great musician, you know, and, and he played on a stringed instrument, but I don't know really what it was like because I've never seen one like that. He sure irritated Saul. Yeah, it did. It should have made him happy, but it didn't. And that was the problem with the guy. He didn't know good music. <laughs> And he was so filled with self that he wasn't willing to share his throne with anybody. And that's a really, a really tragic thing. But anyway, we, we'll get started this morning. So for all of those who are watching by the internet, we are glad you're with us this morning. I think there's more of you than there is of us, probably. <laughs> but we're just glad that you're able to join us. And we're going to have a good time. So let's start off with prayer this morning. Let's go. Amen. The Lord, we ask you this morning if uh, you would just be with us. Again, we're reading and studying from your Bible, and it gives us information that came in a long, long, long time ago. The good news is that we're studying people just like ourselves that had many difficulties and trials and heartaches. They had issues that we face today. We're all human and we know that those things that affected them would also affect us. So we just pray again that you would bless us with some insights as we go along. Help us to understand what people must have been feeling and thinking as they wrote these psalms. Guide us with your spirit now we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. We're going to look at the, the introductory verse here. It's just a real short one. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? Have you ever had an experience in church where you got in and sat down and you were feeling so bad you didn't know, didn't even want to sing? You just wanted to get up and go. But you knew your family would, was counting on you, and if you got up and went, that would, it would really hurt them. And one thing that's even worse, and I saw that in this church a time or two, and it really hurts, because I had to go out for a minute, and I saw the pastor's wife in a car crying, all by herself crying. I saw that twice in this church. And I, I see you shaking your head, and that's the way I feel too. Bad, bad, bad news. That, that doesn't sound good. So anyway, we, we know that as we studied this, and you've probably looked at it anyway, even if you haven't studied it thoroughly through, you have found some places in here that you might be able to identify with, but you wonder why they would write this in the Bible. And... Uh, I've had that question about a number of other places where <laughs> some of the bad things that have happened to people 
and you wonder why God gave it to us in the Bible, then you finally understand when you think about it, this is the very proof that it is the Bible. People that write books that want to sell and make money, they come up with all kinds of fictitious things. But the Bible isn't like that. It gives us real life and, and, the, and the situations that people have faced in their real lives that are very, very painful, very bad. You can remember if you've read the story about Lot in uh, Sodom and how they surrounded his house and what they wanted to do to him. You know. uh, there's another st story in Judges 19, maybe I mentioned to you. I preached a sermon one time out of Judges 19 and it meant salvation for a, a lady, singles club. And yet I wondered, why in the Lord? <laughs> why are you having me preach this, Lord? <laughs> you know. But it, I preached it. The Lord was calling me to preach it, so I preached it. And it meant salvation to a lady that was in that group. She came, joined the church, <laughs> spent the rest of her life in church, and then she made sure that I heard about it. She said the next time Pastor Gleason, to one of the members, comes in, and she was dying, she said, you tell him about me, and you tell him that I hung on to my faith. You tell him that. Were you I was Did you just... Back up and read the yeah, it's, it's a passage in the Bible, and you read the story in Judges 19. We won't get off into that now, but, but it's a very bad story. Very, very bad yeah. story. But it touched her heart. How do you like that? See, God uses anything in his word. That's why it's there. So as we study these things, we know there's a reason for it. Singing the Lord's song in a strange land. Okay, that's where all of us are this morning, whether we know it or not. All right. So it says, we do not need to get deep into the book of Psalms in order to discover that the Psalms are uttered in an imperfect world one of sin, evil, and suffering, and death. The stable creation run by the sovereign Lord and his righteous laws is constantly threatened by evil. I see a lot of that in our country and other places today, don't you? Mm -hmm. As sin corrupts the world more and more, is it getting better and better? No. They tell us, the Bible tells us, it's going to get worse and worse. The earth has increasingly become a strange land to God's people. That's why there's a remnant. There's some people that are hanging on to their faith, no matter what the world does. We don't care. All right? This reality creates a problem for the psalmist. How does one live in a life of faith in a strange land? So this is, um, this is a psalm here, 137.4. It's kind of dealing with some problems that God's people had because they were overrun by the pagans. And uh, so it, it says here, as we already have seen, the psalmist acknowledged God's sovereign rule and power as well as his righteous judgments. They know that God is the everlasting and never failing refuge and help in times of trouble. For this reason, the psalmists are at times perplexed and it's got parenthesis, who isn't? <laughs> yeah, who isn't? Yeah, it's really something. Uh, by the, they, they're perplexed by the apparent absence of God and the flourishing of evil in the face of the good and sovereign Lord. The paradoxical nature of the Psalms as prayers is demonstrated in the psalmist's responses to God's seeming silence. In other words, the psalmists respond to God's perceived absence as well as to God's presence. We can look back. Jeannie and I have done that a time or two. <laughs> when we've looked back, we've said, how in the world did things work out that way? We went where God called us, and sometimes we weren't sure God was calling us. <laughs> but the history of it all as we look back after a number of years, turned out to be great blessing, great blessing. But sometimes to get a great blessing, you have to get your toe stomped on. <laughs> you ever had that problem? Yeah, crazy things happen, right? All right, so how shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? Well, 
as a church, we are facing some things. Because uh, some, some people in this, and, and really that's expected. The devil is so smart. He's turning our world into, into a tiny little group. And with the modern technology, you're going to be able to go into uh, any place with your miniature computer in your pocket, and you pop it out, and you happen to be in Italy, and you talk in it, and the guy is hearing you in his language. And he talks back, and you're hearing it in your language. We don't need the Holy Spirit. He can help speak in tongues, but... But now we've got tools to make it happen, right? Yeah. It's called artificial intelligence. And I'm sure, gl I'm sure they glad they used the term artificial <laughs> because it, there's no intelligence to some of it at all. All right, so um, I'm, I want to take a look here. Uh, we've, we've covered the introduction here, which tells us that Sometimes it seems like God's going one way and we're going the other. Days of evil. Hmm. Do we have any evil around us? <laughs> well, does it happen in the day or the night? <laughs> A lot of it happens at night, I'm telling you for sure. Days of evil. Psalms 90. 79, and I've got it open to Psalm 79. When I was studying Psalm 79, I felt the very same way. And uh, I think if you turn to that, we'll, we'll spend a few minutes in it, okay? And I'd like to read the whole thing. It says, Oh God, the nations have come into your inheritance. Somebody's invaded my house. Your holy temple, they have defiled. They have laid Jerusalem in heaps. The dead bodies of your servants they have given as food for the birds of the heavens, the flesh of your saints to the beasts of the field. Their, blo their blood they have shed like water all around Jerusalem, and there was no one to bury them. We have become a reproach to our neighbors, a scorn and a derision to those who are around us. Right now, it reminds me of a personal illustration. When my wife is frowning, frowning, she always gets upset when I use personal <laughs> illustrations. <laughs> Not always, but sometimes, especially if it's her. <laughs> she doesn't like to be down in public, and I know that, but she doesn't like to be praised either. That's the problem with her. <laughs> she's, a, she's the best cook in the whole wide world, and if I say she is, she gets upset and wants to kick me. <laughs> but it's true. It's true, at least. That's what I think, especially when she makes cookies. <laughs> but anyway, I got a new neighbor, and he's got lots of money, and he's a really nice guy. And one day, I go down to my field where, you know, you guys had some stuff stored, and I'm going along that kind of a flat area where there's a deep ditch on one side, that's a drain. And because it's so flat, you need a deep drain and a big drain because you have to drain on a gravity. So the end of it, where it goes into the other drain out, is deeper than the drain up here. That's, that's you know, a, a country boy knows that. And I know you, you understand it. Uh, you got to have a little grade to get the water out. Okay. Well, the water backed up and made some big, uh, like, basins in the road and whatnot. And uh, I hear... Equipment running, you know, and the gravel being dumped out. So I get on my quad and run down there, and here's my neighbor. I don't know why, but he stored a whole bunch of stuff out of the Uber River down there. I mean, enough, he has enough of that rock that he could make, I don't know, 100 houses out of rock. You know, and some of it, a lot of it is as big as a bowling ball, big, that big around. And he's dumping that out on the road. Now I've built a road or two, and I've never seen anybody dump that kind of stuff on a road, anywhere. Have you? Is that the kind of underlayment you put on a road? No, he's filling in those water pots with those big rocks. And he has the money to do that, so fine, he did it. And I went down and talked to him. I said, look, this 
is not the best stuff to put on here because it's going to roll around. It's going to roll out into my hayfield. Then I'm going to have a broken pinman rod or, or guards and all kinds of stuff in my mower. If this runs out, then the grass goes up. Oh, hey, so you, you, you don't understand. It's going to be perfect. It'll be just fine when I get done with it. I said, what are you going to do about the rocks? And what? I said, oh, well, it'll be great. I'll take care of it. I'll take care of it. Well, the rocks are rolling out, and I've thrown a lot of them back up on the road, kind of as a hint, hint, you know. <laughs> and they picked them up. I throw them up on the road. But there are so many. I've got enough now that would, I mean, <laughs> I've probably got three or four yards of them out there. Because I've waited a couple of years, and he hasn't done a thing. So I decided, well, I got myself a, a, a weed hook that I use for pulling weeds and stuff out of it. And it's got a big teeth on it about like that, you know. And I'm pulling them up on the road where I can load them up and haul them out. So that's frustrating. Now, that, that's the kind of thing that I'm talking about it goes on here. All my praying over the couple of years that he would get busy and think about that, we, we replaced four Pittman rods last year, and you have to take the old one all apart, and you have to drill them. They have to be exact right. They have to fit right. And uh, I don't want to have to replace any more this year, coming year. A Pittman rod is a wooden, it's, they're made out of wood because they're light. <laughs> and they, they go back and forth and drive the blade down here. The blade's down there, and the Pittman rod is pushing it back and forth to cut. That's called a pitman rod, and Calvin knows how to, he's got, he's a tremendous expert at pitman rods. <laughs> and they've got to be exactly right or they won't cut anything. So uh, that's important. But the guards that are over the sickle bars also, they're really important because, oh, bam, it knocks the top right off of them. They're, they're like this, and the blade runs in between them, see? And they're rather delicate. And once in a while, you'll pl plow through a, a gopher mound, <laughs> and you just hold your feet. Lord, help it not to catch a rock. <laughs> because in I've only used rotary. Yeah, well, well this, is for, this is for cutting hay. It's totally different. Uh, yeah, and uh, I, I bought a couple of new ones. They're not new, used ones. But anyway, they're, they're a machine that has to be kept together and kept together right. And I've decided I'm going to have to do it because nobody else is going to do it. So I'm doing a lot of hand work, and I'm down there with this bad arm. And I can't, I can't lift that arm up over there. I have no power to lift that arm up any further than that. Now I can throw it up there, uh, and it comes right back down. So I'm not sure if it... Money, Della. Della's here. That's what's here. See, so so I can hold the handle here, but I got to work with my left hand, and I'm right-handed. <laughs> so it's it's kind of a pain in the rear, you know. Uh, but anyway, those are, those are the. Oh, I'm only about a third done with it. It's a long job. It's from here to the highway or more. It's a long job. But I'll, get, I'll do it. I'll get it done. And it has to be done right, too. Uh, I can't dig the whole road up, but I get the stuff that's along under the fence. See? But anyway, I didn't want to get off on that. I just want you to know those are the kind of things we face in life. And the issues that occurred before he uh, bought the property, I can go back in. Those are the same kind of things that I had to face, and I'm still facing part of it because those things don't just go away. We are in the devil's backyard. We are. And uh, so, so we're going to be having some problems. We live in, 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 it says here, in the days of evil. What is at stake here? The psalmist seems to grasp the great controversy between God and the powers of evil. There is a text I think I'd like to have you read, but let's let's go on here and get the the the, the feeling of 
of Psalms 79 first. We just read the first part here. Uh, I'm just backing up a little bit. There was no one to bury them. Talked about all these people being killed out there and their blood like water running around Jerusalem. We have become a reproach to our neighbors, a scorn and a derision to those who are around us. Now, in other words, in those days, uh, it was different than our days. They had, when they went to war and when they fought, how did they fight? They didn't have drones. They didn't have uh, atomic bombs. They had swords and they were here and they went at each other personally. So when he says blood's in the street, well, it means that they got hacked down. And it, and it might be their relatives that got hacked. Bad news. Okay. So, so the psalmist is bringing out something that's terrible. And then in verse 5 he says, How long, Lord, will you be angry forever? Will your jealousy burn like fire? Pour out your wrath on the nations that do not know you. You know, I, I, one time was gonna, this guy was, he was selling me bricks that were inferior. I couldn't use them. Had to quit using them because the, the um, inspectors wouldn't accept them, you know. And so I had to, had to quit using them. But he was making these bricks and thought they were just tremendous. And I told him, no, I, I'm, I'm not going to use them anymore. And he says, well, the Lord's going to get you. His Lord was going to get me. That's the kind of Lord that he had. So here I was with something I really couldn't continue using. And uh, it was my own God was going to get me. <laughs> that, that doesn't set good. You know, it doesn't feel good, does it? Have you ever had that experience? Uh, as a pastor, a time or two, I've had people spit at me. I came out of a ho house in a trailer court one time, and as I came out, I was on a porch-like thing, and <coughs> this guy was walking by, and he says, oh, he says, uh, what are you? And I said, well, I'm a pastor. I'm been <coughs> spit at me <laughs> walking off. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Sure. And if you've ever been to Jerusalem, maybe it's different now. I don't know. But if you walk down the street out there, those right-wing religious people that love the Lord, they'll do the same thing. They don't want you. You're that filthy Gentile. <laughs> yeah. That's, uh, that's what, uh, what happened there. I've had that happen Numer numer numerous times, uh, you know. But those again, as a pastor, it's kind of a privilege to serve, and you just you, it rolls off your back, and and it's it's the rare thing is it isn't the general thing, but it shows you that people are like that in our world, and that we have to face it. Yeah, churchgoers. They're, there's a church in Oklahoma that celebrates every time they, uh, our military boys get killed oh, they and they bring them over. Sure, they have a big celebration and they're so happy they got killed. I heard, I heard one of our, <laughs> one of our uh, important people in our government say they're so happy all those people that died for us over there were losers. Think they were losers? I don't think so. They died so that we could have our freedoms. And we are having our freedoms on the backs of young boys 
My folks lost one of the boys that worked for us, Stanley Green, and they loved him to peace. He was a wonderful boy. Mm -hmm. They lost him. He, they, they killed him in, in the war, World War II, they killed him. He was killed by sniper fire in the Philippines. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it can be, fortunately, we have not lost as a family anybody that way, and we've had pretty healthy families, kids, and so they've been, uh, we've been spared a lot of grief that I've helped a lot of people with down through the ministry. That's, that's the job of the pastor. He doesn't, have, he doesn't have any favorites. He can't play any favorites. He, he does his job in and out, day and night, doesn't matter. Um, so anyway, days of evil. Well, this is what he's talking about here. Uh, notice verse 6 uh, in this. Verse 5 said, How long, Lord, are you going to be angry forever? Will your jealousy burn like a fire? In other words, for us. Aren't you jealous for us? That's what he's saying. Pour out your wrath on the nations that do not know you. Is that what your Bible says? Now, I remember when I read this text, I remember very plainly that uh, James and John and Peter and some of the others said to Jesus, these people said, you can't stay here. Shall we call down some fire on top of them like Elijah did? Shall we just bring down some fire out of heaven and burn them up? What do you think Jesus said? Well, he didn't do that. Huh? Yeah. Jesus said, you don't know what manner of spirit you're of. So in the New Testament, we have a contradiction right here. We have a, we have a fact that Jesus loved everybody and he refused to even think about that. That wasn't even a thought in his mind to do that. And yet here's the psalmist saying, when are you going to do this? Pour out your wrath on these naughty people. And on the kingdoms that do not call on your name. Why? Because we want to, this to be retaliatory. This is a retaliation. Why? For they have devoured Jacob and laid waste his dwelling place. They've come in and they've conquered our beautiful city. And, uh, and now, Lord, you've got to take care of this. That's your job. You're busy and do it. And when you consider the setting, if you go, could go back there and actually live there and see how violent they were and how all this went on, you might see it very differently than you do when you just read it through. They've seen all of that and that horror, and they're thinking about God's promises. And he's not, remember, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, thou art with me, you know. God is with me all the time. He's going to watch over me. That's, that's one of the reasons we are at where we are at right now. Go back and read... Uh, Passages in Ezekiel, like right around Ezekiel 20, 21, 22, 23, it says all the wonderful things that's going to happen to Jerusalem. It's going to bustle with righteous people, and the wicked are all going to be pushed out, and everything's going to be wonderful. All of those promises are taken to heart and, and felt that they are literally for them today. They do. And yet it hasn't happened over 2,000 years. But they still, the right-wing element in Israel, the element that's hung on to the law, the first five books of Moses, and who believes that all of the prophecies are meant for them, some of them were. One of them was 70 weeks or 490 years that was given to them to repent. And they went to the Babylonian captivity and they came back and said, we're never going to disobey God again. And they became the right-wing, hard-fisted, demanding Pharisees. You could only walk like half a mile on Sabbath. And when you took a bath, you, you had to take seven towels with you because they were afraid that you would work. You might, if you had one towel, you might wring it out and God would curse you for that. <laughs> yeah. 
That's what they believed. I got the book to prove it. <laughs> there's, a, there's a book in my library by a man that was trained to be a rabbi. He was, he, he was working on that. When he accepted Christ, his whole life changed, and so he wrote this book. His name is F.C. Gilbert. He's a Seventh-day Adventist, or was, and you can get his book. You can read all about the kind of things that they believed in and did. They turned out to be like these wicked people. <laughs> and now they're over there just slaughtering how many? They have slaughtered 27,000 people? Ah, those are God's people? Well, they have taken to heart what uh, Jesus' disciples felt. Anybody who stood in God's way, they were doing the wrong thing, and so you need to just let them have it. If, if, you, if, you, if you even think they're likely to do it, you hit them. And that's a doctrine we never had until a few years back when one of our presidents said preemptive strikes. The United States never did that. We were always, we, we waited until Pearl Harbor, Harbor. We had to be attacked before we'd attack people. Nowadays, it's all right to go and bomb the heck out of them if you think they're going to do anything bad, and we're doing it, aren't we? Hey, don't blame anybody for it, because that's what we've come to. That's our philosophy nowadays. So when we read these things, I think of some of these things, and it makes my skin crawl. Yet I can, I can understand, as you're watching a person in your family bleed to death, in the streets of your town, how you how that would make you feel. I would. I'm <laughs> I'm such a angry, nasty Irishman <laughs> that if somebody came to my house and tried to get my wife, he'd be dead in a matter of seconds. Happened in my family. My n number two son, the guy got invaded and got in his house, and he had an upstairs bedroom. <laughs> he got his gun and came down there, and boy, I'm telling you. He hit that guy, and that guy, when he got up, he went out the door and was gone. <laughs> well, that's the way I feel, too. I've gone right. Uh, I wouldn't be afraid to shoot somebody to come in to harm my family. <coughs> but they have the same feelings. Help us, O oh God, of our salvation, for the glory of your name. Now, here we're hitting on something that I want to pause for a minute because I have talked to people about prayer meetings and having prayer and all the rest, and I believe in it. I believe we should pray. But I also believe that God should answer our prayers. And he does, but sometimes it seems like he doesn't at all. So James says the reason we don't have our prayers answered is because we're all selfish. We pray selfish prayers. Good thing to think about because they usually are selfish. And we don't even think of it because we're so selfish we can't tell we're selfish. <laughs> uh, but here's the question. Doesn't God answer selfish prayers? Sometimes he does, doesn't he? Yeah, sometimes he does. How can we, how can we know that God would answer our prayers. Now, this psalmist is smart. He knows something that we need to know. And here it is. Because we Adventists are smarter than all the others. Now, if you don't believe it, just ask an Adventist. You'll find out how smart we are. We've got all the right doctrines, right? Yay, yay, yay. I'm writing... I am writing right now for you guys and for anybody that wants it, but I'm writing it for my kids. I'm writing on a passage of scripture that we totally screw up constantly. And we don't, we don't have it right, period. And I'm writing because I think that before Jesus comes back, we need to have it right. And I've gone back and studying the Hebrew, going through the language very, very carefully. I'm exposing something that has not been really exposed since the Reformation. Luther missed it, Calvin missed it. They all missed it. Why? They missed it because they follow tradition. Tradition. 
instead of studying carefully and making sure that they put it all down right as it's written in the Bible, they just accept what some others have, have, have done and assume it's right. And yet the commentaries, not Adventists, the Adventist commentaries have it right. And the commentary that we used to use before Adventists had one, he has it right. <laughs> and yet we haven't got it right. I find that out because I'm just nasty enough to ask people questions once in a while when I'm shopping or wherever I'm going. Um, it has to do with original sin, and I'll often ask people, well, when did sin occur? And they point to Adam and Eve. You'll never understand the book of Revelation given to us by Jesus himself the last book in the Bible that he himself dictated through John, you will never understand it until you understand original sin. And I have a lot of fun with people because I'll ask them, uh, well, when did sin start? Oh, everybody knows that. It's in the Bible. I said, where? Well, Adam and Eve. They stole God's apple and they deserved to pay the price and they did and that's where sin began and I'll say, no, you're wrong. Ah! Then they're looking at me, you stupid. Don't you even know the Bible? You're a preacher? And I say, no, that is not where sin started. Well, what then? It started in heaven with an angel called Lucifer. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Now they got it. What's wrong? The events are right, but that's not original sin. Original sin started in heaven. And when we don't start at the very beginning, we put down a lopsided foundation. You ever try that? Her uncle one time was going to build a house, and he got a level down at the hardware, went back, and he put down some long piece of board down, and it was level, and so he adjusted a little bit, and he worked all around his house, and after he got it up a little bit, it just didn't look right. So he turned his level around the other way, and one way it said it was level, the other way said it was not level, because <laughs> the level wasn't level. Now, can you build a level house with a wrong level? Then you can't build a concept of this book unless you have the right interpretation and understanding of it. It's impossible. And we've, we've, we have done that as Adventists even though we know better. We do. We do. So I'm pointing out a, a problem that Adventists have along with the rest of the world and that's messed up the Reformation. The reason I got started on this, Wes, is because of this book this guy gave me. And he really took Adventists to heart, to task, because of their concept of original sin. And he had it wrong, too. But his, his whole premise is built on a different concept. It's on the concept of, of justification and sanctification. Those are two big words they use that they never should have used, but they do to trans, translate the Bible. Okay. I'm just telling you from the professor that I studied with, it was so much better than any other professor I've ever studied with. <laughs> Those are big words that mislead people because they're legal references. The problem with, with original sin is not legal. It is not. But you'll find them always using that. God's apple was stolen by Adam and Eve, and so they had to pay the penalty. They paid a penalty, but it wasn't for stealing an apple. It was for what they did before they stole the apple. And I'm going to show you. I'm going to prove that to you. Yeah, it wasn't the apple. It was for what they did before they stole the apple. That'll give you something to you get your Bibles out and start thinking about that. <laughs> See if you can come up with the answer. <laughs> okay, that's a test. All right, so, so here we have a, a man that's writing this. His name is Asaph, and he's writing this, and he says, okay, Lord, uh, it says here, on the, uh, no, 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 no. help us, O Lord, of our salvation for the glory of your name. Now he hit the nail on the head. He hit the nail on the head. Has anybody lied about God? Uh, okay. Who, who has lied about God? Yeah, Lucifer, the light bearer. His light went out. And there's a light in the first 
the second chapter of Genesis that went out too. It goes right along with it. The light went out. Yeah. Sin began in heaven with Lucifer. And what was the problem in heaven? Hmm? Yeah, he was jealous of God, wasn't he? But what did he... He disseminated a lack of trust. Okay. He deceived to have um, questioning God's character. Exactly. So you got it exactly right. He questioned God's character. But he did that by lying about God. What do you think he lied about? Shouldn't get off the track here, but these, these are important things. What, what did he lie about? What did Lucifer, the light bearer, well, what was his job? What was his job? He had a job, and that was why he was called Lucifer. We get the word luminescent from that, the lights. He was like the light because he was clothed in light. Let me ask you, was he a created being or was he a, a, an, a, an immortal being? Created. He was created. He wasn't immortal, was he? And, and the Bible says clearly, Jesus that the wicked are going to burn in a lake, of, a lake of fire that was created for the devil and his angels. God has a fire coming, first of all, for the devil and his angels and all of those who refuse to trust God and do what the devil did, lie about him, are going to go in the fire. So the point I'm making is that he's a mortal being. The devil's a created being just like we are. It's a created being. Because God can create a family just like that. That fast. He can create his family like he did the angels. He could have created all of us like he did Adam. But we are created beings. We are not immortal beings. All right, that's extremely important. So what did the devil say to Eve that was going to cause her to distrust God. Did God know that we would die? Okay, that's part of it. What did the devil use as evidence that you couldn't trust God? Insinuation. He used insinuation. He yeah, insinuated. he insinuated something, but what was it he insinuated? Well, he said you should not surely die. Ah, you got it right on the head. So what did he do in heaven? What do liars always do? They repeat the same lie, only make it worse. Because when you point your finger at their lie, well, then they have another excuse for why they did it, and make, they make it righteous, right? All right, all I'm trying to do is to help you understand the devil hasn't changed his course of action. That's why so many people have got this... Uh, immortal soul concept and all kinds of other things that you can't die. That comes from the devil. Because that's exactly what the devil said about God in heaven. Same thing. Why would he do that? Why would the devil lie about God? And why would he use that particular thing more than anything else? Why would he do that? He he hates God's people. He hates us. What we're reading right here is the fact that he hates God's people. He hates them. And the psalmist knows that. The psalmist knows he's hating God's people. He hates God's people. And he wants God's people to go totally extinct. That's why he attacked. Hmm? Unless his own diabolical pals or the wicked third could be his generation. Okay. Scott, you're bringing up a very important point. And the point is that the devil right now, for us, the devil wants to either eliminate us or convert us. Right? right? The Bible says that Where is the b- created in God's image, and yet anybody that's in God's image exists. Yes, exist. yes. So, but he wants his own characteristics to reign on earth. Yeah. He, he, what happened was, if you study the Bible carefully, you come up with some things that maybe most people don't talk about. The devil was created 
And then the devil was cast out of heaven and was cast where? To the earth. To the earth. Okay. How did he feel as he watched Adam and Eve being created by God? And then this beautiful garden and beautiful home created just for Adam and Eve. How did the devil feel? Yeah, 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 yeah. Right, right, right. Why did he? Do, why did he do that? Jesus, I just read it this morning. Jesus, Jesus said, "The prince of this world, world is coming, and he has nothing in me." Nothing on me. Nothing in me. Very important, in me. He can't touch me. He's tried and tried and tried. But all of his temptations have not worked. Okay, why is, 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 why does Jesus say that? Because the devil is still demanding that he is the prince of this world. He owns it. He was put here first. God threw him out, and he had to come here. There's a reason behind it. He couldn't go anywhere else because nobody else wanted him. So he came here, and he claims this earth as his own from the time he was cast out, not from the time of creation. And he wants to do one thing of two things. He either is going to con- God is either going to convert you, or he's going to take you and convert you. And if he can't convert you, what is he going to do to you? He's going to kill you. He's going to kill you. Sure. That's, this is what's coming at the end. It's called the Battle of Armageddon. The devil is going to try to destroy everyone. And he's going to, the book of Job, again, is somebody's first book ever written. These things are, are literature. They're, they're, they are prophecies. They are there for us to learn a lesson. What did God say? T- promises we can stand on. Yeah. Exactly. I don't know. You've been you uh, you <laughs> you've been studying my writings. <laughs> I think it's been in the Bible. Yeah, I'm studying the Bible. You're right. You're right. You're right. What's the last sentence that said what? Okay. That's right. And you have you have just hit the secret of the problem that I'm writing about. Hit it right on the head. See, the devils in heaven above use the same th- tactic there that he used with Eve. You don't have any evidence otherwise. You have the evidence that he was proud and that he was uh, capricious. He, he would do anything to have, get his own way. But what stemmed underneath it was that he had done something terrible to himself that made him willing to lie. And uh, if we don't understand that the issue, the real issue that went on in the Garden of Eden and goes on right now is over the character of God, not over the character of us. And it's the same issue. It hasn't changed a bit. Why would the devil, look, why would the devil use the concept of death? The whole universe was running beautifully. And God, when he rebelled, didn't even kill him. Right? Why why didn't God just eliminate him? Now I've heard Adventists can answer that. Well, the answer that is given is because if you killed him, then you would serve him out of fear sure. rather out of love. Sure. Because love sure. has freedom. Sure. But freedom equals sure. risk. Sure. But love is worth the risk. Well, the point here is that Death would not solve the problem. If God, if God instituted death, he would only prove the devil to be right. Because the devil is saying, just as he did to Adam and Eve, God is lying about death. You can't really die. You're immortal beings. And look, if you don't believe it, show me where anybody's ever died. Look at over that world. They've been, they've been existing for billions of years. Just look. God is lying. You can't believe him. If you were to die, it would be because he would kill you. Right. Yeah. Now, now, again, this comes from studying the Bible. All I'm saying to you is that as I've studied the Bible, and as we have Adventists made these points, 
then it's absolutely, without question, the big issue is death. Still is. Paul says in 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter, that the last enemy, which is death, is going to be destroyed. No longer death. It was destroyed. I'm sorry? It was destroyed. Well, it will be, destro it will be destroyed because we're still dying. <laughs> but death itself was destroyed at Christ's resurrection. Yeah, yeah. Because mm -hmm. Jesus sure. overcame death sure. at that time sure. in his perfect character. Sure. And, and what he did was prove what we're talking about completely wrong. And that's another reason why I'll also say this, that we don't have half the picture of the cross because the other half we always constantly don't look at. We look at it for ourselves. We want to be saved. Our selfish nature has for down 2,000 years focused on that. No, God, Jesus died on the cross for the Father. He did because he demonstrated by dying on the cross and being resurrected, that God is not what the devil has made him out to be. And he died for all of us, too. See, But we always focus on Jesus dying for us. No, he proved on the cross that the devil was a liar. And the lie that the devil was spreading was, look, you may take away everything that Job has, but if you take away his life, he would rather fight you than to die. He'll fight back because he doesn't want to die. So Jesus came and says to all of us and to all the angels and to all the worlds everywhere, no, God is a humble being. He would rather die himself than to see one of his children suffer and die. The devil says, no, he's lying. It's all over death. The issue here is death. So Jesus came, and when he kneeled down in that garden, he says, Father, if there's any other way, please, if there's any other way. The Father says, no, there isn't. It's my character. I can send an angel. They can die for those people. That's fine. Or some wonderful person like Noah maybe could die. No, that's not the problem. The problem is my character, so you have to show that I'm not like that. The devil's lying. Three times. Three times. Now, we always look at from the other, other direction. We look through the telescope from the wrong lens. No, this is about God. You're not going to trust a God that you don't really know. Jesus came so that we would know without a shadow of a doubt what God is really like. Nobody can ever bring anything up ever again about God and his character. They can't. It's been sealed forever. So when we think about that and understand the whole picture, the bigger picture, then it opens up the Bible to us too. The book of Revelation is all about that. It's all about, and this is all about this. What we're talking about here is all about this. God has done whatever he's had to do to defend his own name. I was just reading, uh, again, preparing for some of this, thinking about it. Anyway, we'll go to a minute or two. We're not off target. We're talking about what goes on here. So read the Psalms and whatnot. But I, I just took a minute and read about Hezekiah and his experience. Hezekiah did not do like King Saul or anyone else. He went into the sanctuary and he laid it before God. He said, Lord, they're, they're coming with a million people and he, they wiped out the whole world and we, we know that we can't, we can't fight them. The Syrians are going to wipe us off the face of the earth. And the Rabchak, he comes and talks to them on the wall. Hey, well, look what we did. We killed all these kings and we, you know, go back and tell Hezekiah to listen to us. You might as well give up. Look at, look, at the, look at the mass of an army we've got. So he went the first time, and it only got worse. The Rabshak came back again and laid it on him. You can't stand up against us. Hezekiah goes back to the temple again. And this time, Isaiah comes to him. Isaiah, the prophet, comes to him and says, Look, day after tomorrow, They'll all be gone. 
every dang one of them will be gone. You won't see them again. That's my word. I will not let one of them enter my kingdom here. I will stand up for it. They got up the next morning and there's nobody left. God, the Bible says, God killed 185,000 Assyrians. Wiped them all out. And the, and the king that came with him, he went home with his tail between his legs. Isaiah said he would. He'd go home without no army. And he even said that, that your end would come and his, his own family killed him. <laughs> yeah. That's the story. That's what we're talking about here. And when, and when things get tough, we've got to remember that God is on our side. And if you want the answers to your prayers, you better pray. Uh, the best way to pray is, look, Lord, I want to represent you. And I'm doing the best I can in my humble way of doing it. I know that I'm a wretch. <laughs> And I know that you know it, but I'm still standing for you, Lord. And this problem actually is representing you. It's your problem. So they're going to think less of you because of what they're doing to me or because of this situation, whatever it is. You put it in God's hands. If you want to be a good preacher, you've got to discover that you're, not a, you're nothing but a big mouth. Without the Spirit of God, you're not going to be helped in the, in the pulpit. See? We, are, we are called as those people were. We are called to face the enemy every day. Every day, Jeannie and I end our prayer asking God to, to guide us with his Spirit today. It is the work of the Holy Spirit in us that gives us any power. We don't have any power otherwise. <laughs> so that's why we do what we do. Is because, and, and, and I'm kind of uh, feeding you some things that I've studied very thoroughly for the last 20 years. Uh, you know, and I, 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 am, I have always been a, a, not a very good, uh, uh, you know, intelligent, super intelligent person. You know, I, mean, I just had to pray, God guide me. You know, help me to speak the truth because you're the only one that really knows it better than I do for sure. Yeah. How do we do this little book called The Battle in the Civil Wars? <laughs> and it goes through multiple stories in the Bible how God intervened where it seemed impossible. God took over and what would happen. Yeah. And that's how we are today. We need to realize God is fighting for us. It's a matter of trust, isn't it? Now, let, let me tell you again, so we're closing here. My biggest struggle right now, <clears throat> my biggest struggle, of course, is with self. And when somebody dunk, dumps all this rocks that big in there as your, your road gravel, which I've never seen in my whole life, uh, and then they're, they're not willing to take responsibility for what the damage it might cause. And they promise to do it. My, my Irish nature says, punch them back. <laughs> so I drag those big rocks out and I put them all across the road so they can't even drive on the road unless they pick up the rocks, right? <laughs> hey, that's what, my Irish, that's what my Irish ancestor tells me to do. <laughs> Isn't that right? Yeah, I think I should do that. Teach him a lesson, <laughs> right? Oh, come on now, Scott, you know. <laughs> okay, this good man back there sends, tells us that we have to quit. We've covered all the issues that we were going to cover in the Psalms this morning, but I hope you listen and you think because I'm talking about something that has, that has affected our church for 2,000 years. Not us, but the Christian church for 2,000 years because they followed tradition. Let's have prayer together, and we're going we're gonna to stop because the Lord has something to tell us through Della this morning. So let's pray. Gracious Father, again, we're just thankful that we have the Bible and that we can go study it. We can know exactly what it says and that we need to... to follow what it says, 
regardless of where the world goes, regardless of where the church goes, it's all up to us for our individual lives. You're saving us, and you're saving everyone else in the world who loves you and follows you. So we just pray now that you would bless us with your guidance as we go now on into our worship service. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.